Welcome to Jar Your Mind. My name is Joey. In today's podcast, we are with the wonderful Debbie Phillips. Debbie is a life and executive coach for over 25 years and is the founder of Women on Fire. She is a coach, she's a speaker, she's an author, and she has made her vision in life to nurture people with their strengths, gifts, and talents. And that is what we're talking about today, vision, vision. And how do you tap into your vision? What do you need before you can even have a vision? How do you navigate your vision in relationships and in this changing world? I had such a wonderful time with Debbie and I hope you all enjoy this talk as much as I did. Let's get right into it. Welcome Debbie to Jar Your Mind. Hi Joey, so great to be here. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, are you ready to jar some minds today? <laughs> I'm so ready. You know me and you know I am with your I help. Do, I do. I do know you. And I, I wanted to talk about that because I was thinking about like, oh my gosh, how long have we known each other now? It's going over three years. I was thinking about that we started training together at near the end of 2019, right? Near the end of 2019. Yep. And yep. Um, you met on the plane one of my clients you sat right next to her i did and you yes yeah, so the way that it happened was i was just talking with this woman in the airport and she was telling me about a business that she had in boston where she focused on women training women and she said but I have the best trainer in Naples if you're interested. And I'm like, yes, I am. Aww. It was you. So I thought if the trainer's trainer has the best trainer in Naples, not Boston, I want to know this person. And yay, I got to meet you. Well, it was it was awesome. And we 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 hit it off really well. We started training at the studio. And then I was still I was starting to taper down a little bit with my personal training, but I was still going pretty strong at the studio, but not long after that, we hit COVID hit and everything. And we kind of had to change our plans. And so the studio closed and um, I was really kind of, and we're going to talk about this too, with vision and how things have to change sometimes, but I was already kind of changing a little bit with my vision and where I was going with, I mean, I'd been personal training for so long and, and I knew that things were changing, but um, I still loved having some clients. And so we started training on Zoom. Right. Yeah. I was just so impressed that right out of the box, I remember you saying, we can just train on Zoom. And I was like, well, how would that be possible? And you're like, we're going to get a couple of bands and we got a kettlebell. And you really knew right away that that would work. And I was very doubtful and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> three years later, mm -hmm. three years later, still going strong, right? <laughs> right. And still, you know, really strong and centered and you change up the workouts every time it makes it really easy and fun. And also I think about the time that I save and, you know, you too, is that we're not traveling back and forth anywhere and we can just, you know, train from the comfort of literally my living room. Yeah. And, and wouldn't you say that it has kind of become a Zoom kind of world? I mean, so much is done on Zoom now or virtually and right. And I wanted to ask you about that too, with with just this new new world kind of we're living in, and how people are pivoting from the way they kind of saw their careers being, or even their life being, to to all of this really new changes. That I mean, it's it's I know for me it's it's been a whirlwind. And at first I was like really um, pushing against it, so to speak, yeah. you know. And yeah. um, and I noticed that it was really affecting me, like just personally with my attitude and just kind of getting, you know, upset about certain things with the way life was being. And, 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 uh, and so how do you, how do you help ground people through, through that kind of change that they're not expecting with their vision say, and, and that's what we're gonna talk about a lot today is the vision and, right. and getting through, you know, such a, such a traumatic change uh, right. or, or simple changes, all, any of that. Right, right. Well, in those instances, Joey, I always think about what is it you can control? You can control your reaction to things. You can control your daily practices. What is it you can control? You know, none of us could control COVID or whatever was going to happen with that. But we could have a set of principles, a set of practices that we control. 
you know, I know you know and understand and foster in other people the power of meditation and your own meditations are amazing and terrific. And um, that is one of the things that I talk to, to clients and people in my life and that I practice myself and practice throughout um, COVID. Um, you know, I'd like to say it's very much a daily practice. Although our memories are so faulty, I'm always surprised. I now often use the Peloton meditation app when I'm not listening to you. <laughs> I use a variety of things. And, you know, it'll say, wow, you know, you meditated four times this week when I swore I meditated seven. <laughs> but it's really important to have daily practices, a set of things that you enjoy doing, that you're in control of, even if you only do it for five minutes. You know, a lot of people are like, well, I don't have time to do daily practices. Well, the downside of that is then you're kind of at the whim of whatever happens in the day where if you ground yourself first thing in the morning and sorry, television shows, but you know, do not turn on the today show or good morning America or the radio, but take time to ground yourself. You can listen to something inspirational, read something inspirational, um, be quiet, breathe, take a walk, take a walk around the block. I mean, that touch nature in some way, do anything that feeds your soul, even five minutes, 10 mm. minutes. You know, yeah. And, and make a difference. yeah. What, well, what's your main go-to to like find inspiration to start your, your day? Because I know yeah. there's so many techniques and everybody's like, oh, let me watch this person's morning routine or this person's, but we all kind of have to find our own way with that, I think. But like, what, what is your way of really finding inspiration, getting out of bed in the morning, um, your practice that you do almost every day, we'll say. <laughs> yeah. Well, twice a week, I work out with you first thing in the morning, and that's just incredibly powerful and meaningful to me. And so I would consider that one of my practices. I am, I really do like apps and there's so many of them, you know, and including your own work that are five or 10 minutes because mm. then I'm in control of that. And I know I can always do a five minute meditation. And so I tend to listen to that. I keep a stack of books by the side of my bed, which I always fear is going to like topple over and, <laughs> you know, like do me in. Um, but I can pick up any of those books and just open them up. They're just inspiring books that I love. And it's, you know, it's everything from Deepak Chopra. I'm just looking because I've got a whole stack here. Um, as you know, my husband, my business partner and husband died four years ago. And so I tend to have a lot of grief books, which I'm looking at the stack right here on my, on my desk, but they're just books that I can just pick up and I can just read a passage or, or two. The other practice mm -hmm. that I have is I have Alexa. And so, um, and I live in a, uh, like a one floor, um, house. And so I just tumble out of bed a lot of times. And if I'm going to make the coffee, I, you know, I'll listen to happy by Pharrell, or I'll listen <laughs> to something that I really love and just listen to that song and dance to it. And especially for feminine women, a really important practice is to move your body in a flowing way and in a, in a, in a dance way. Um, it's just a great way for us to get our bodies um, moving. I love that. I, you taught me that. And I thought that was, and so I started thinking like, what, cause I love music too. And, and, and you know what I found, I started doing recently and I started going back to the gym and doing the Stairmaster. And you know what music I listen to? What? I don't know. <laughs> I started listening to my old school, like gospel Christian music because it just, you know, it just got me. I just, it brings back like just that, that, that praise type of feeling. And it just gets oh. me, you know, I mean, it just gets me going and it just really inspires me for the, for the rest of the day. And it's just, it's just funny because I, you know, that's what I loved about church growing up. And I mean, I was a, a hardcore Christian, like when I was growing up and into my twenties even. And that was what always fueled me and really got me just so excited was not really anything else other than the music and just feeling into that inspiration of that. Like, I don't know what it was, but, and I just said, you know what, I'm going to tap back into this. And uh, yeah. So between dance and, and music, it's, it is, it's so powerful. Well, I think that is so fantastic. It's a fantastic suggestion because I think there is some, there's a quality of praise music 
that's incredible, you know, for people and, you know, anybody who's ever, this is, you're just raising something so great. Think about when you were a kid and what moved you or think about experiences you've had that moved you. Um, I was in politics for a number of years. And one of the things when you're in politics, because I'm not African-American, um, I would, you know, I wasn't exposed until I went into politics and uh, and with the politicians I worked with, we went into African-American churches mm -hmm. and there is nothing like the music. Oh, and so yeah. for, you know, for you to tap back into that thing that inspired you as a kid, um, it, usually if it inspired you as a kid, it'll inspire you, you as an adult. Mm. And, um, you're just making me think I got to add to my playlist, which I have this handwritten playlist on yeah. my wall in the kitchen, you know, so I can always look up and just call out a song to Alexa. I love that. That's great. Um, so I was, I wanted to tell you, so I was, I was watching a, a video from Ryan holiday and he's mm -hmm. all big on stoicism. Right. Okay. And he did a video recently. It was actually just the other day. It was called the 12 questions that will change your life. And he yeah. said that, you know, people are always searching for answers, but it's really the questions that teach us the most and the right question at the right time can totally change the direction of your life. And I started thinking, oh my gosh, this is, this is what Debbie does. Like she asks the right questions at the right time. And that's how I think you're able to kind of inspire people to come up with answers that they already have within them. And, and so I just want you to, to maybe touch on like, if I was to to ask you about creating a vision and 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 maybe the next stage in my life and someone asks you to help them and, and they ask you with a question i was thinking okay how do you answer this but how would you answer it with a question back to them well joey you're just so wise and so smart and that is the key yeah um the question that i meditate to most often and for many many years is this what's the love I have to give to the world before I die? And so anytime I get stuck, I just, in my journal, because that's another thing that I do as a daily practice, I keep a journal, I make it really easy. I type very fast. So I just type in a journal. I don't even mess with a paper journal, although that would be wonderful. Um, but I just, I want to get my thoughts down really quickly when I get stuck or when I want to just make sure I stay on track the question for me is what is the love I have to give to the world before I die? And then, you know, there's other questions too. If you don't resonate to that in terms of um, figuring out, okay, what is it that I want to do? You know, it's, it's questions. I um, have a wonderful teacher. I've had wonderful teachers in my life, still have them. Uh, one of them, as you know, because we've discussed this is David Data. And I love a question that he asks, and it's simply this. Why do you exist? What are you here to do? And so I think the simplicity of pondering on those, why do you exist? What are you here to do? And just allow yourself to meditate on that right, just right free form, however it would be, always brings up answers. So it's the simpler thing we do in answering these kinds of questions. And then there's another, there's another thing because um, I've, you know, I've worked with clients now as a coach since 1995. And most people are in search. They know there's more potential inside of them. They they know they want more. They just don't know how to get there. And that's really true for all of us. And it doesn't matter what station you are in life. Um, because I've worked with people who are enormously successful and they're like, okay, now what? <laughs> you know, what's next? Or, or, okay, can I do better? You know, it's just kind of this thing in a lot, in a, a lot of us. And so, you know, I think that the... Um, you know, just taking the time to really explore what are my gifts, strengths, and talents. And if we're stuck on that, the people around us know what they are. And so many times we're reluctant to ask them, but I guarantee you, if you ask the, you know, five to seven to 10 people closest to you, including your children, including you know, family, including your closest friends, people who you trust, if you say to them, would you please tell me what you see are my gifts, strengths, and talents? They will, there will be a pattern of what you're meant to do in this world. And sometimes it's really shocking because sometimes it's not what you're currently doing. You know, mm. someone, 
I had a client who was a lawyer. And when I had him do this exercise, he actually ended up and asked 40 people and 38 of them responded. And he was a lawyer, but the general flow of the 38 people was you should be doing something in the arts. You should be a Broadway, you know, maybe a Broadway producer, maybe, you know, an orchestra um, producer and nothing to do with being a lawyer, but our friends see what our gifts, strengths and talents are. And do you uh, think, do people push mm -hmm. back against that at all? Do you think people embrace oh, yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Because like, you know, this man in particular, he's, he like looked at all the things that people said about him. He's this lawyer retiring. He's like, oh yeah. So I'm supposed to be a Broadway producer. And I'm like, mm -hmm. and just so you know, he went on and he actually, you know, uh, was a producer on a show called you're in town. Um, and he uh, ended up owning rights of Wicked. Um, so he went on and had a very illustrious career because once he got used to the idea he could be anything other than this lawyer, he was able to, um, you know, really, really play in that. Would you say that's kind of what inspired you to, to start Women on Fire is to bring people together that kind of are able to help with that, those type of questions with each other? But I also yeah. wanted to ask you on top of that, I know one thing you talk about is not giving advice. I want you to kind of touch on that with, yeah. With, yeah. Yeah. Well, as a coach, you know, there's all kinds of training schools. I happen to um, fall in. I began coaching myself personally when there was no such thing. I simply <laughs> began coach. I began doing for other people what I'd wish somebody did for me, which was I thought, I had in my career, I started out as a journalist, then I was um, a press secretary to a presidential candidate, and then I worked as a press secretary to a governor. I was very young in my experience, and I just remember thinking, oh, I wish I had somebody to, you know, really pull it out, make me better than I am, because I always felt like mm -hmm. I was so not good enough. And so once I left my numerous jobs, I just started doing for other people what I'd wished for. Later found out, months later, that it was coaching. So I was on the very, very front end of life and executive coaching before there was ever a name. No one had coaches except Olympic athletes or, <laughs> you know, basketball stars or, or whatever. So people didn't even get the concept because they were like, well, you should be able to do this stuff on your own you know, be better, be, you know, live into your potential. Well, if you could do that, you would do that. Most people, you know, were just like me, like, okay, what's next and how can I be better? Coaches are basically trained to ask great questions because okay. we all have it within us. And it's really important to find our own, you know, I like to say like our own steel rods, like who are we really not influenced by other people or donated by your family? Cause you know, our families grow up um, and they kind of have these expectations of us. They have limitations of us and we have to get clear about that at some point. But once we really get clear on what are my gifts, strengths and talents and really work with that, you know, then we just need the support of going, you know, going out in, in the world. A lot of us are taught, oh, don't be too big for your britches here. And, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm. And so we have these limitations and this yeah. is, an, again, you know, and, and work with, because this is about expansion. Why are you on this earth? What are the gifts you're here to give? You know, you might be you know, you might all be about fairness and okay, well, that might lead you into a career that, that um, makes a big difference in the world about fairness. I happen to be, my number one value is love. And I just feel like everything I do, I want to give love with it, no matter how tough, how easy, how, whatever it is. It's like, how can I give this with love? In our culture, you know, love is like a soft skill, which drives me absolutely batty, <laughs> um, you know, because it's like, no, like, yeah, but whatever you're, you know, some people it's like excellence is their number one value. And so how can you go into the world with excellence? So, um, you know, there's so many ways to get at what your vision is, but it is really important to answer that question. You know, why are you here and what are you here to do? And then get the support around you to be able to, to live that. 
Yeah, I, I, you actually stole one of my questions because I was going to say, what is your highest value? And now we know. But so I know that, and you've taught me this, that you, you, need, a, you need to know your values before you can create the vision. Yep. And so you know your you know your highest value is love. So you begin there, and and that and in that you can create start to create a, a vision. Correct. Right. Right. Ex exactly. Yeah. And just to remind everybody, your values you're already doing. It's it's people think oh you know we all have the same values. We don't ha all have the same values. And I have done this work for you know whatever a million years now. And it's actually kind of rare that someone's number one value is love. Um, and, and among my values, um, and all of us should know like our top five to seven values that primarily drive us. And so, you know, intimate relationship is a value for me. Love is a value. Um, friends and family are a value. Helping others are a value. Children, I don't have my own biological children, but children and having children in my life um, is a value. Nature is a value. And so, but there are many, many others. And those are my primary values. If I didn't even know those were my values, I'd still be out there knowing that I thrive when I'm outdoors in nature, knowing that I love helping other people, knowing that I love children and all ages of children. Um, and knowing that I just have this love flowing from me that I want to give in whatever I do. So whatever it is for you, what would you say is your number one value? It's funny you, you you asked me because you asked me that a few months back and mm -hmm. I had never been asked that question before. And mm -hmm. I, I really like, I think I answered it pretty quickly, but mm -hmm. I didn't know why, but it just, and I said, peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but it really got me thinking like later, um, mm -hmm. why, why is that my value? And then I just started digging more into like this kind of just in, in, just asking myself these questions. And, and then it, it really made me just that one question. See, that's why I said you asked the right questions at the right time. <laughs> and you didn't even know it probably, but, but Turn the whole thing. That <laughs> <laughs> was a reporter to start. Yes. People used to ask me to stop asking them questions. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But I, yeah, no, I think that the, 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 the thing with the piece was I started thinking about it and, and, you know, with the whole, I was mentioning earlier with the whole thing that everything is changing in our world and, and COVID and just how the life got turned upside down for a lot of people. And I think I was just bringing on this angst within myself that wasn't even really mine to have. And, um, you know, I, and I started thinking, this is why I feel a little like, not so great sometimes you know like i've been a little down and and just like taking on the, the issues of the world like on my shoulders like and i didn't even realize i was doing that and uh so i i started realizing okay this is why i started doing the meditations and i just need to get back into that and not just for you know doing them for other people but actually doing them for myself and listening to and meditating and getting back into what i can control like you said what can you control and just finding that peace within me and um and then you know when you change the world changes right so you, and so it, it, i just wanted to thank you for that for asking me that question um at the right time because it really was powerful for me to kind of go into that idea of that value wow and i love your exploration of that and this is true for everyone you know watching and listening is when this kind of thing comes up and you feel an angst or an upset or, or angry or whatever to stop and say to yourself, is this coming from me or is this donated to me or given to me from something in the outside world that I have no control over? Mm. Is this really, you know, from, from me? And you just, you know, what you just said really, really illustrated that because so often it's donated you know, it's a thing that our parents said, or it's a thing that, you know, we just saw on television and it really got us triggered and got us going. But when we can just, again, this notion all the time of going slower and being more reflective and quiet and doing our work in a daily meditation, even yeah. if it's five minutes, yeah. make a yeah. difference. Does that thought belong to me? Like I just did, I'm doing a thing on the four agreements right now. And I did one on being impeccable with your word and, but being impeccable with your word, it's like, it, I'm, 
I did a meditation with it, but it, it was all about all of these thoughts are going to be coming through your head endlessly. And, and like you said, are they yours? You know, like, are you like, we have the choice to claim them or not claim them. But the only way to really take is you have to be aware and take the time to say, is this mine? Do I want to claim this into my, and, and the meditation was about, if it is mine, I want to claim it, then I bring it into my heart. Right. And then from the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's like, are we, you know, is this, is this angst and whatever is happening? Is that something I want to embrace into my heart? Or do I want to, you know, find a peace within me and have that from that speak, you know, from that heart speak, you know, this, this peace instead of this, this angst, for example, you know, I mean, Joey, can you imagine if everyone would just do this? What kind of a world if they would just stop? Stop and listen. Yeah. <laughs> what you just did. And, and the word meditate too is kind of, you know, it's confusing for people. And it really it's just like, just get quiet. Like you said, you don't, it, there's no, it, it, there's meditation. The definition can mean so many things, right? And, and really we just live in such a world of the attention is just so all over the place. And, and if we can just, whatever you want to call it, draw things back into ourselves and, and get quiet. And, and, and what is your value? What are your highest values? What are your highest qualities? And, um, and so I wanted to, to ask you, because you have a quote um, by Gandhi in your Facebook that says, happiness is when what you think, say, and do are all in harmony. And I just yeah. want you to touch on that and what you think about, about that saying. Yeah. That quote. Well, of course, of course, I love that. I mean, there's so many, there are just so many great quotes out there. And I would just say to anybody again, watching or listening, I think it's important to have quotes that inspire you around you. Mm. And um, it's funny, I'm actually sitting, I have a couple of spots where I sit in at a, at a desk in this space. And in my other room, I, you know, I'm surrounded by quotes. And I, uh, you know, one is the Goethe quote that is be bold and the mighty forces of the universe will rise to meet you. Ooh, that's good. Or support you. I know I really, <laughs> really do love that one. And I've, uh, you know, I've, I've thought about that one for, for years and years. And of course the Gandhi, the Gandhi quote too. And as it real, as it relates to vision, you know, when you're in alignment because it feels easy and it feels, um, and you feel like you're on purpose. And, and so just paying attention to the, you know, to the elements of that. And, and it's like, what makes you really happy and go do that. You know, there's a meme on the, you know, internet right now. It's like some little girl and she goes, do you hear me? Like, just go be happy, be happy, be happy right now. And I, and I laugh, I laugh at the simplicity of that, but it's really true. Like we keep ourselves from being happy and aligned and we just don't give ourselves permission to just be happy because we think the other shoe's going to drop. But when we're doing what we love and serving some sort of purpose and it feels easy, that's when everything just, just flows. So I always just say, just, you know, pay attention to what you really, truly love. Mm. Do you find that in the, in the self-development world is that we do tend to like way overcomplicate things. And I mean, it's great to have many techniques and many, but it's like, I know when I was just starting out with this about five or six years ago, I was like reading over here and I still do it, but I was like, Oh, I got to learn about this guy. I gotta do <laughs> and it's like, but what you say is so perfect. And it's exactly what I teach with training. Uh, at, like it's the simple you know, it's the simple things and it's, you know, and it's finding what works for you and just sticking with that. You don't have to like add a thousand things. Right. 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 I mean, Joey, what you and I, that is such a perfect analogy to what we've done in training. First of all, I am 67. I feel strong, balanced. I am strong and balanced. I feel the best in my body I've ever felt in my entire life. And we've done it with two bands, a kettlebell, a <laughs> yoga mat, the counter. <laughs> yeah. chairs. And yeah. so to your point, and this, you know, we can extrapolate this to life. It really is the simple thing. And a lot of times when I'm writing in my journal, I'm blah, 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 blah. I go, stop. 
what's the simple thing here? What's the easy thing? Like, why, why, why do even I, with all my training, with my, you know, what I do, why do I complicate things? Cause it's really the simpler, simpler thing. Mm. And it's a meditation. I want to go back to that because so many people just, you know, they think, okay, I got to do it right. Oh, I'm doing it wrong. Like, there's no way if you take five minutes for yourself and then people go, well, I've got antsy pants. And I'm like, okay, then just do a walking meditation, mm. go walk for five minutes, you know, out your door and back and just, you know, have some beautiful music on and just be, or think don't, there's nothing, there's no way. It's just take time for yourself just to breathe and think for five minutes without a bunch of outside distraction. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I want to get, I want to get, <laughs> yeah. I want to get into your new podcast called yes. Secrets of Better Haves because I want to get into vision and vision with maybe a significant other or how you share a vision or your vision. Um, but we can get into that. But I want to, I'd like you to talk about because I know the first podcast, and I'm not sure, I don't think it's out yet, right? Right, but, right. But your Trail. first podcast is all about you and the power couple of you and Rob. Yes. And if you could just maybe go over that a little bit, and then we'll talk about vision with, with a partner, perhaps. Great. I would love, I would love to do that. So I um, have been working primarily because of women on fire. Um, and, you know, I started that company in 2003 and it was, it was to provide inspiration strategies and support for women you know, it, it basically has for almost, you know, almost 20 years. I um, took a sabbatical from that last year because I just needed some, I needed some space. Um, Rob died four years ago. Rob was my business partner, my rock, you know, as well as my husband. Um, he died young. He died just after he turned 59 um, of gastric cancer. And it was just, you know, it was a devastating blow. It was a great marriage and partnership. And I just needed more space. And the moment I had space, I just started talking to people, doing different things. And the podcast came into my life with a very good friend of mine, whose name is Dan Mulhern. He was the first gentleman of Michigan. His wife, Jennifer Granholm, was the uh, two-time governor of Michigan. And uh, Dan is a professor at the University of um California in Berkeley and just has always been a really great friend. He too is a, is a life and executive coach. And so he had come up with this idea around better halves. And I think again, in our culture, we don't talk enough about how can we be in an intimate relationship, better halves to each other, but that isn't an, even the, all, I mean, that's huge and major, but also we need to be better halves to each other in any kind of partnership and business partnerships. Um, you know, I think of Serena and, um, ah, her sister, the Williams sisters, Venus and Serena. Venus, yep. Yeah. You know, like they're better halves of each other. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's all these different iterations of that. Anyway, Dan was interested in starting a podcast with, um, a really close friend of his and uh, named Marcos Kunalakis, who's a foreign correspondent. And he's married to the, um, Lieutenant governor of California, who I hope someday is going to become the governor. Anyway, the three of us have joined efforts on this podcast because we come from three different places. Those two are married to women and they need to be very supportive of being a better half. Um, I lost my better half. And the truth is, if you're in an intimate relationship, one of you is probably going to die before the other. We never address this in our culture. We don't like to think about it. We do think about it, but we put it, push it away. I mean, if you're anything like me, um, I certainly, I was like, oh, someday I'm going to have to think about this. Rob could die. I could die. And unfortunately at age 57, he got diagnosed and he did die. Um, so I'm really on the show one to talk about, you know, all the things that Rob and I learned as a couple and to be a better half of, of each other. And and Rob and I had a very clear vision together. We were in this world together and we helped other couples develop a vision. Rob and I were in this world to help other people, and well, all people um, express their gifts, strengths, and talents. That's why we were a couple. We did that work together. We did that work with our families, you know, the kids in our family. We felt, you know, we're here to support you. And how can you be, you know, the best? expressing your gifts in the world. So I urge every couple, you know, to know why are you together? 
know, some people just want to have children, but that, you know, that's, that's also prescribed, you know, like, because at some point your kids are going to leave. Um, we had a couple, one of my favorite visions. Well, I had two favorite visions. We, we worked with many, many couples. One couple's favorite of my, of them was they came up with, we're a couple that shows our family how to make magic. And that couple subsequently took their children and traveled around the world. And I thought the 10 year old twins. And I thought, wow, that's a cool vision. And then we had a couple that were very worried that their vision was too shallow, but their vision was we're in this world together to entertain other people. And I'm like, I think that's totally cool. Who doesn't want to come over to your house on Saturday night for a movie and chocolate party, which were the kinds of things they were doing. Um, so it's whatever you and your partner decide that you want, you know, as a, as a vision. Did I answer the question? Yes. <laughs> yes. You want? <laughs> so you're saying, so you want to have a vision together. You want to establish a vision together. That's awesome. And then, and then what about, what about as an independent person? Like, let's say you begin a new relationship with someone and they have kind of their vision and you have your vision and, and then you have a vision together. And, and, and how do you go about just co cohesively combining all of that right, right. with a partner, right? Right. So just to back up to that, I yeah. encourage every single person to have a vision of what you want in a partnership. So yes, have a vision for yourself and have a vision for that partnership. And so, uh, you know, this is the first place that I've ever spoken publicly about that. But after Rob died, you know, I spent three, three and a half years, you know, in pretty deep grief. I was working with wonderful teachers, wonderful healers, knowing the grief process as I do. I knew I had to just lean into my, my grief. I did begin dating pretty early on, but I just didn't have you know, it, it was lovely. I dated some very lovely men. I'm, I'm so deeply grateful for that experience, but I just really wasn't ready um, as much as I enjoyed, you know, going out to dinner with someone. And I, I just, I just didn't have the feelings for it. And then about six or eight months ago, I wrote a vision for a new relationship and it was called my amazing new partner. And the, it, it actually flowed right out of me because I was ready to create a vision for this person. And I wrote it. I was kind of surprised. I was like, wow, this is, you know, it's pretty good. And it flowed right out of me. I put it away. I may have read it a, a few times, you know, over the course of, you know, shortly after I wrote it. And then I just went about my work in my life. And then um, this, you know, whatever it is, January. So February, March, April, you know, three months ago, some friends introduced me to a man and he fits every single thing in my vision and I fit in his vision because he too, we kind of exchange visions because um, we hadn't actually met in person yet. Um, and we just recognized each other. And so I firmly believe calling, you know, you can call in who you want by getting very clear on what do you want. And then you just kind of let the universe work its magic. And so Jim and I are actually just kind of keep pinching ourselves going, how did this happen? How did this happen? And then we're laughing because we're going, you know, the universe really had our backs and we didn't have to do anything. And he, he did his work in a very particular way in the form of a hypnosis um, meditation that he listened to every day that had the attributes of the woman that he wanted. I had my vision. And now, you know, we're coming together as a couple and we're developing, you know, we haven't settled on yet our own joint written, but we will because we know we're a match for, for each other. So anyone watching or listening, it, it, you're just going to, when, when you come together you can just simply say, why are we a couple? And just write that out. You'll know. I mean, Jim and I already know his, his wife too died. And so we already know, you know, part of our work together is just the healing. Um, but it's way bigger than that. That is, so amazing. <laughs> that is an amazing story. I just love that. And I just love that you found each other and it sounds like the universe found both of you and, and, but you, but, but you did, the work at the beginning to say this is what this is what I vision right this is what I want and so let's go back to when we'll use this as an example to when you decided to write that and you just said it was the right time you just knew it was the right time you just listened 
to your intuition, I would suspect is what you did and just took that and just kind of started writing, right? I mean, right. it's not, I, I, again, like, let's not complicate this, right? It, <laughs> And I was aware because of course, in my life, I've had so many clients write the description, you know, now I was in a marriage in a relationship with Rob. So, and, and I had done that many years ago before mm. too, as well. It's just, I'm much, much better at writing the detail of it. Mm. Had guided many, many clients. I knew, and I knew all along, I knew, I knew a few months after Rob died, I had the awareness is that I would have another chapter. And I was open to it, but of course I was just in the throes of deep grief. And so I didn't really place a lot of time thinking about it. Um, and so, you know, I always had it in the back of my head. Oh, I know I need to write my own description, but there was never the right time. And then all of a sudden one weekend, um, it happened to be Labor Day last year. I just, I, I just, it just. I was like, you know, you, I was said to myself, you know, you know, you need to get on this. And, and actually my, I had two teachers, uh, one, one, one was a therapist and one was, you know, is David data. And, you know, they both were like, you know, W is the moment you get really clear on this. And of course I knew what that meant, you know, and they knew I knew to write a description. <laughs> and so I was like, dang, I got to do my own work. <laughs> <laughs> And then it just poured, you know, I just, I don't know. I just got up one morning and I just started writing it and it flowed out of me. And I was like, Ooh, dang, this is good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that's what that's, I, I love that you say that because that's what I always find. It's like, until you start doing it and like, that's like anything in life, right? Until you take action, until you start, until you get out the pen and paper, or the, you don't know what really you just kind of are trusting, you know, that you do know. And it, and it will come. And that's just so, so such a powerful message for people that sometimes, you know, just feel like, oh, I don't, I don't really know what to do or, you know, and just either maybe write about it or just, and again, right. meditate about it. Right, right. <laughs> well, even that, even that, right. You, you know, I've found the way in sometimes is go, I don't know what I'm supposed to say here. I have no idea. I know I have to do X, Y, or Z, or I know I want to think about why can't I, why am I stuck? You know, you just write, 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 or talk, talk, talk just around the problem until it, until yeah. it breaks open. Ask those questions. <laughs> Ask those questions. Exactly. And you know, there's so much fear around things. And so I have this little thing in my mind that um, I actually heard from a former, I, I was listening to a speech. Um, I, I went to graduate school in, uh, in Boston and I, so I was mid career, I was in my thirties and I was listening to this speech by Warren Christopher, who is our secretary of state under Clinton. And he said, he was talking about how in his moments of fear, he tells himself, just jump in the stream and swim. Mm. And so a lot of times when I get up against something, I just have that in my head to, and I just go, just jump in the stream and swim. And we all know what that feeling is like, because mm. it's so scary to jump, you know, even just from the, you know, side of the stream mm -hmm. and get your feet wet, but do it and you just figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been on both sides of feeling like I've started before I was ready. And then also, and then kind of saying, ah, oh, I kind of wasted time. And, 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 but then I, and then I, and then, but lately I've been more, a little more deliberate, but I've taken action kind of before I've been ready anyway. But what would you say to people that, that are, that are kind of just, like like the Gandhi quote, you know, you want to take your thoughts into words and then into action. And and what what would you say to people that they have these great ideas and they have these thoughts that they want to take into action? They don't quite know how. I mean, what's what's kind of one of your things that you might you know kind of inspire them to just you know dip their toe in or jump it all the way in into that stream. I take the teeniest, tiniest step possible. So you're actually describing two different, two different people. One, there are people who just jump in and then they get all like, Oh, I made the mistake. And I'm always like, you're fine. You're fine. Just course. Correct. You're mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. Um, usually. So don't, don't worry about that. So people who do that, um, you know, it's, the, oh, there's, there's some name for it. You know, it's, it's, um, you know, they take action before they think it all the way through. Mm -hmm. That's usually totally fine. Um, 
and, and, but mostly people don't start. People topple over because they make it so complicated. They get this big fear going. And so as a coach, one of the questions I, I often ask is what is the teeniest, tiniest little step you can, you can take. It's ridiculously small and people will usually laugh. They'll go, well, I could read a book on the subject. And I'm like, even smaller than that. I can look something up on the internet. Great. Get started. (laughs) You know, just take a teeny tiny step because everything starts with that some Mm. small step and then be led like, okay, you research this. Okay. Now does that lead you any other place? More people lose it because they just get toppled over by the daunting task of, of going, I need to, um, you know, I want to be a dress designer and I need to be Donna Karen. It's like, well, guess what? Donna Karen has been doing it for 99 years, you know, exactly. you can't go from here to here. You start with the teeniest, tiniest step with consistency. So that's yeah. the other tricky thing here. Uh, one of my favorite stories is the, um, is the author, um, Martha Beck. She had some sort of autoimmune disorder and she couldn't use her hands. And so she couldn't type. And she had this book in her and she, she took a pencil and she wrapped uh, rubber bands around the pencil. And she wrote for 15 minutes every day. I believe the story was like for 365 days in the end. And whatever 15 minutes garnered, you know, it was, you know, a page or two in the end, she had her book written <laughs> and it did turn out to be one of her, like Danny's boy or whatever, one of her best selling books were. And so that was illustrative of me in working with clients and, in and, and as advice, as guidance for myself, like nothing is impossible. Just take every single day, take one, do one thing toward the thing you think you want or desire. And it's incredible what can be the result. If you just are consistent, most people stop doing it and that's fine if you lose interest in it, but if you just stop doing it to stop when it's something you still desire, then that's the loss. Yeah. It seems almost like a snowball, like a snowball. It just keeps piling up. It keeps piling up and yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. Um, so, so what would you say right now is the thing that inspires you most and to get out, to get out of bed every morning. Now I know you said love is your highest value and your values, you know them very well, but do you think things change over the years or think have any, has anything changed in terms of what you're really most excited about at this stage in your life? Well, I think what's changed obviously is being in a new relationship and having been in a relationship in the, in the past and knowing, and knowing a lot about relationships, you know, as a coach and studied, you know, with some really great teachers about how to be in a great relationship, some great therapists. And so to be 67 and to be on the cusp of knowing that I can have another love relationship in my life, another intimate relationship in my life is just you know, it's dazzling me because it's so fun and it's so exciting. And intimate relationship is, as one of my, is one of my values. And at the same time, I am, it is such a natural vision for me to love my work. This has always been the truth with me from the time I was, I know it as even a young woman, I love helping other people be successful. And I love seeing their gifts. One of my gifts is that I can see other people's gifts and that that is very natural for me. And I love that. And I will do that until my last day. And there's so many iterations. So what I would say to people, as you develop your vision, don't be afraid to tweak it or change it or go back to it because Um, you know, I've really had the same vision. I've just done it in many, many different forms. I've, I've had so many different life experiences and careers, and I've always been able to, you know, use that vision of helping others see themselves or helping others reach their potential. And so, but you know, it's changed and tweaked and then who would ever would have thought, I mean, I mean, six months ago, a year ago, I would have no way of knowing that love would, you know, show up in the way that it has. I have the maturity, you know, the life experience to know how precious it is, how fleeting it is. 
and, and to be able to make the most of it. So that's truly what's getting me out of bed every day. And um, Jim and I live in different cities. And so now we have to plan, you know, how, how are we going to live in the same city? How are we going to create a home together? And what's that, what's that going to look like? And it's, it's just actually really great to be an adult and get to do this. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's, that's so exciting. That really is. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, what else do you want to tell people before we kind of wrap things up? I know you mentioned the podcast and is there anything else uh, you want to share in regards well, to that? Well, I just hope people will tune in to secrets of the better halves and, um, and if you like it, like us, rate us with a <laughs> five stars or whatever, whatever it is. Um, I'm still just really learning this whole new podcast world, even though I've done, you know, podcasts. You've done now. hundreds of podcasts. Yeah, for, for <laughs> like I have. Fire. yeah. and, amazing. um, but this is, you know, this is, this is a bit different, but yeah, just, just, um, I think, I think this notion of if you are in a relationship, you know, every day you can make the choice, I'm going to make this better. And if you aren't in a relationship and you desire to be in one, um, don't cheat yourself out of that. You know, I see so many people afraid or feeling, um, you know, I'm 67. I met a 69 year old man. I meet so many people even in their fifties. They're like, well, there's no men out there. Well, that is not true. Or they'll, or men will say to me, there's no women out there. I'm like, oh, that is not true. <laughs> and, um, so I guess I would just encourage, you know, I do think love is the most important component. I think there's in intimate relationships is one of the only places we can really deeply grow. And, um, and I think it's just worth doing. So I think that's what I'd leave people with go love and go listen to our podcast secrets of the better house. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And, Thanks, and, you know, Jamie. you do, you really have, I wanted to tell you, you really have like a way of just instantly connecting with people. I know you did that with me and you also have this natural way of finding like the best in people and like reminding them of those qualities. It, and you, you've done that for me over and over again. So I want to thank you for that. And thank you so much for coming on the show today, Debbie. Oh my gosh. Well, first of all, I really <laughs> enjoyed this. Thank you for making me my strongest. Yes. I'm like strong and balanced. <laughs> I never t topple over or fall any, you know, anytime. you're amazing. Yes. Strong, <laughs> powerful. Strong like bull, right? Strong like right? bull. <laughs> but Joey, thank you so much. Thank you for yes. your work. Your work is so important. And, you know, to all of your listeners, I just really thank them for being here today. Yes, thank you.